the gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap, one love for all So we all can make it in Standing in the gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One not for all So we all can make it in Studying to show ourselves approved Rightly divine the word of truth Increasing our faith to envision our freedom So we all can glorify our God Standing in the gap Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Make it in Make it in Make it in Wanna hear him say good Good and faithful servant Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Wanna hear him say, good and good and faithful servant. Wanna hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord. Of the Lord, joy of the Lord. Lord, joy of the Lord. Of the Lord. July the 4th holiday and the time we've been on. We've been off a couple weeks now since the last time and we're and I'm excited to say that we are uh, opening a new study and I would say one of my favorite studies. Um, we're standing in the Gap USA and we um, uh, are a Christian education uh, study here and we uh, we try to make sure that people understand that there is a gap that has developed between God's word and, and, and his people and how, how we react to God, as a matter of fact. And because God doesn't change, we as people change. And as we change, since God doesn't change, that moves us further and further away from God, creating a gap. And God in his uh, scripture has informed us and let us know that he's looking for those Christians that are willing to stand in the gap for him. And so that's why we named this Standing in the Gap, because we stand on God's word. And we want to make people understand what God's word is, that it hasn't changed. And so they can make good decisions, or at least say uh, informed decisions on how they want to spend their lives. But as being a Christian education program, we always start out with a prayer. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you, Father, for bringing us safely back into the Standing in the Gap ministry that we took a couple weeks off. We thank you for your provisions, Father. We thank you for your protection during that time as so much is going on. So we want to thank you, Father, for that. We want you to open our hearts, open our minds as we get into a very, very critical and basic study. And we want to thank you for allowing it, Father. We ask you to lead us and guide us in this study, Father, so that your people, Father, can get the word that you want them to have, Father, so they can make their decisions, Father, with an informed mind. And we ask all this in your name and for your sake. Amen. 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 
now let me introduce the uh, person who uh, keeps all this going and, and uh, who I couldn't uh, do any of this or operate without, and that's my wife, Marvel. Marvel? Good morning, Saints. I uh, am glad to be back. I want to encourage you to join the Facebook Live room. I'm here in the room by myself right now. Hey, but come on down to the room. The link is in the um, Facebook chat. And also, there's a link for our outlines um, that's also in the Facebook chat. So, uh, and I also want to um, send up a prayer for our dear sister, Michelle Owens. Her brother passed away right at our last class, right before our last class. And um, her brother's homegoing services today. So, uh, Sister Michelle, we are praying for you. We are praying for you and your family. All right. Amen. Okay. Well, we... Uh... We just uh, finished our, our last study, which was uh, Sex in the Bible, and we wanted to change up, of course, uh, because we figured we uh, convicted so many people in that study that uh, they needed <laughs> <laughs> they need We a all break. got convicted, didn't we? <laughs> we, all, we all needed a break from that. <laughs> but so, so what we're going to do, and I call this my favorite study, and it's called God's Not Dead. And it's uh, basically to uh, let you know we're and 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 I need to let you know we're changing up a little bit from our our uh, format because we usually at the beginning of these classes have what we call a stand in the gap moment, and what that is is we take an issue from uh, current events that's on the front pages of newspapers or your news shows or whatever, and we uh, apply standing in the gap principles to it, God's word. And so, uh, but we're changing them. We're not going to do that in, at the beginning of these um, broadcasts anymore. Those will be done, but they will be standalone, separate, and we'll send those out to you. And they'll be shorter and uh, more to the point and um, not as involved as we are. We, we get involved in this, uh, in this class. So the standing in the gap moments will, will be coming. So keep your eye out for them. All right. All right, I call this the case for God and Christ. The case for God and Christ. God is not dead. And um, it can also be called evidence for God in an age of uncertainty. Evidence for God in an age of uncertainty. And so the question that, that comes up to the front, God is not dead. Why do we need this study? Why this study? Well, if you are anyway uh, uh, connected to understanding what's going on in the world today, you might find the answer to that. Because um, in our in our Revelation study, we talked about the great or Babylon the Great, and Babylon the Great wants you to believe that there is no God, and so. Um, for those that don't understand, it, it's based in Revelation where they talk about the great prostitute of Revelation and um, Babylon the Great. Babylon is the world system, okay? And they called it Babylon in Revelation. They could have called it the Roman Empire. They could have called it the Greek Empire. They could have called it the United States or the European Union. World, The world system today, it's a world system. And it's a world system that uh, has no regard, no regard for God's word. It has no regard for the rights of the little guy versus the big guy. It all really has a lot of uh, emphasis on the rights of the big guy, the, the rich and the famous and the powerful and those who are trying to stay rich and famous and powerful and rule the world. But by doing that, they, they, they go against the word of God, and if you remember in Revelation, the uh, the great Babylon was revealed right before the fall of the world. It's a world system, and world system has been in place since even before Babylon. So, the great Babylon, in order for for the world system to operate as it does, it has to 
convince you basically that there is no God. Or what they might want to say that God is dead. Now, when we talk about God is dead, understand, people are really, most people who, who use that term are using it not to say basically that there was a God and now he has died because that whole concept mitigates against whoever that was being God. <laughs> because if he's God, he don't die. So basically what they're saying, there is no such thing as God. That's what, that's what the basis of it is. And when there's no such thing as God, then God is uh, uh, basically all of us. And we do whatever we want to do. Or as the slogan today is, do you. You do whatever you want to do. Because see, in Christianity and, and, and religions across the world, there's certain rules, <laughs> certain guidelines, things that you don't do and all that. And in today's world, where the great Babylon is in charge, it basically does whatever it wants to do. And it doesn't have any regard for those who it may crush and kill and destroy. So, the great Babylon who wants you to believe that there is no God. Now, some people want you to believe there is a God, but not the one that is worshipped by Christians and Jews. Others want you to believe there is a God, but not that Jesus is the Son of God hmm. or the Messiah. Some feel that a belief in God and his rules and regulations stops them from enjoying their lives and the things that they want to do. Because if I want to do whatever I want to do, why would I tell somebody that I, why would I listen to somebody telling me I shouldn't do something I want to do? See, the myth that every opinion, that every lifestyle is acceptable it's totally against the concept of Christianity. Totally against the teachings of Jesus Christ. But we, we have a just do you generation now. And I'll just put this out right now. Is a just do you, meaning whatever you want to do, is straight, concept straight from the pit of hell. Straight from the pit of hell. Now, others twist the rules that um, they say, well, there's a God, but, you know, his rules are not really what you think the rules are. The rules are what I think the rules are. And therefore, I twist those rules so I can do the things I want to do. Hmm. Now, that's, that's, a, uh, that's, that's what you might call a mess. I call this study the case for Christ, and, and basically, it should be called the case for God and Christ, meaning, I'm an attorney, so when I say the case, what's the evidence? How do you prove this? Evidence for God in the age, in an age of uncertainty. So, as we talk, the great Babylon, drinking the blood of the saints, and, and uh, totally going against the word of God and that's our world system today as we said that's it just do what you want to do now there's a problem in today's world because see people now have information at their fingertips and they if you're ever talking I, I've, I've seen this and talking to millennials and you'll tell them something and they'll say hmm, let me see if that's right so they get to their phone and they click it up and they say, oh, no, that's wrong. <laughs> Wikipedia and Google and all that <laughs> say different than what you said because so you don't know what you're talking about. I've got I've got here. And people have never had that type of ability to have information at their fingertips. So for one thing, you have to be very careful about what you say to this generation nowadays. Because they have the information. In generations past, they could say, people could say whatever they want. Nobody knew. Not today. And they had to go to the library and look it up. Yeah. Or if you if you were lucky enough to have Encyclopedia Britannica at your house, you could look it up in there. Yeah, but 
see, Encyclopedia Britannica and all those books that we used to have and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing doesn't work well today because people say that take too long. Oh yeah, I can just go boom boom and get the answer. And it's it's I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying that it can be bad for some people. And you know the other thing about you know googling something and Wikipedia comes up. You know Wikipedia is what people put in there. Right. It's not confirmed. It's not. I mean, it might be right. Usually it is. But, you know, how do these conspiracy theories get all over the Internet? Because people put up stuff that ain't, it's not true. But it looks true when you see it on your screen, on your phone, on your computer. There's one true thing, and I think you told me this uh, uh, a little while ago, is that whatever is in, let's say, in Wikipedia or in, uh, in, in uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, is put in there by those who are in charge of putting facts somewhere and they choose the facts they want to put in there or the opinions that they want to be in there and all that. And so a lot of times when you're looking at those uh, references, they're a bit tainted by somebody's opinion. And, well, how do we get around that? That's called study. <laughs> That's called study. And so... You can't get, even in this information age, you can't get around study. And so that's what we're doing here, Christian education study. Now, younger generations, though, are not simply accepting the existence of God because their parents said there's a God. You've given me all this ability to have information and all that, so you say there's a God? Let's see the proof. Let's see the evidence of it. You see, because what you're asking me to do is stop doing things I want to do because you say there's a God that says I shouldn't do that or it would limit some of the things I do. I don't want to be limited. I want to just do me. I want to do whatever I want and all that kind of thing. Now, I will listen to you. Now, I'm not saying the millennials don't listen to you or this new age people don't listen, but they want you to back it up. You see, why is there such a lack of young adults in church today? I mean, you can look at almost any church and see that you have a lot of older folk. Then you got a lot of kids coming up. And there's that gap in the middle. Another gap, huh? There's a gap in the middle. Why is that the case? And why are an increasing number of uh, them claiming to be atheists or agnostics? Now, millennials, the information age actually it itself mitigates against an unsupported belief in God. What that means is that I'll, I'll believe in God, but I got to have some support. In the information age, I got all this information. And so I should be able to find in this, in, in all this information at my fingertips, something that allows me to believe that there is a God. Mm. So, what's the question? The question is this. With all this information, how do we explain to an unbelieving world that needs more than faith to believe in God? You see, because we always, you know, we were taught, you got to have faith. You just got to believe. Today's, in, in, in today's society, they want more than that. And a lot of times, see, and it, it was the same way back in our generation where we came up and our parents would tell us stuff and we would say, y'all don't really know what y'all are talking about. <laughs> like Pip said, Mommy, you don't know everything. Exactly. <laughs> but today, they, they have more weapons to come against what we are telling them at their fingertips. So, the information age, uh, millennials, and even those not millennials who, who have access to all this information, they want to know, okay, you say there's a God? Where's your evidence? I need evidence. Mm. So, how do we explain to an unbelieving world that needs more faith, I mean, needs more uh, than just faith to believe in God? That's, that's at the bottom of this study because you may be able to tell people stuff you may be able to give them some something which you call proof and all that 
but it's got to be proof to them. It's got to be proof to them. So you see, we need to be able to rationally explain the wealth of evidence. There is evidence. We need to explain the wealth of evidence that exists which proves the case for God and for Christ. And people say, well, wait a minute. Shouldn't faith be enough? Should not faith be enough? And what you're telling me then is, um, what if I doubt? I don't have faith and I need, I need evidence. Does it I mean I'm doubting? Or, and, and isn't doubting the, the word of God a sin? Well, see, that's where you need to study. Because almost everybody, I'll tell you the truth, almost everybody throughout their lives, as they come out their life, have had some doubts. You say, some people, I ain't never had a doubt about God. Well, you know what? Let's look into the case for Christ. Let's start. I give you give you some evidence. I take it straight out of the uh, straight out of the Bible. What about this doubting? There was a famous guy in the in the Bible who doubted. You remember that was that was Thomas. He was one of the disciples, and he basically said, <laughs> "You saw who? <laughs> I I'm not gonna believe it until I see the holes in his hands." I want to see the, the spear of uh, injury to his side and all that. Meaning, I have doubts. I need some evidence. Ooh. So maybe this generation now that's saying that I need some evidence isn't that far away from what has been happening all throughout history when it comes to a belief in God. So, Thomas doubted that the persons that the other disciples had seen was actually the risen Christ. And he said, I ain't going to believe it until I see it. He needed, he needed some evidence. Now, the question is this. You doubt the existence of God. Isn't that a sin? And isn't that something that will lead to you going to hell. Doubting the word of God. Is that what is that what Christianity says? If you doubt, you're going into the lake of fire? I hope not. Because everybody has doubted and has some doubts and all that kind of thing. It's not that you don't have doubts. What what that means is you're you're questioning. You know, if you're studying, you're actually questioning to a certain extent. You're looking for the proof of it. You're studying to find the uh, the truth of it, the basis for it. Now, what about the concept then that real faith, if if you have faith in God, that's blind faith. Just believe. Don't worry about the evidence. Just believe. Now, I'm here to tell you that um, real faith isn't blind. Look at Thomas. Thomas had faith, but he doubted. But then, what happened? Jesus appeared, showed him his hands. He saw the injury to his side. And, and with the evidence that he had in front of him at that time, he believed. No more doubts. I believe that this world is the same way. I believe that those who are out there questioning the existence of God or doubting the existence of God or Jesus Christ, just need some evidence. They just need some evidence. And it's our job to present them with that evidence, rational evidence, to support that there is actually a God. Now, some people say, okay, Thomas doubted. And you're trying to tell me that that's not a sin. You're trying to tell me doubts won't 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 send me to hell, then what's the concept and the and the uh, justification for that? It's called grace. <laughs> you see, the the magic, and I don't say magic, but the uh, the beauty of Christianity it allows you to doubt. It allows you at one time even to say, I don't believe. 
and do whatever you want and all that. So long as you get to a certain point and now you believe. And that's called grace. That's called grace. Now, and, and of course it covers your sin, but I'm here today to start you on this study and that study is God's not dead. God is here. He's here. There's proof of it. And if you need proof like that and Thomas, then we're going to show you that proof. And now you'll have all you need to make your decision whether you're going to follow God or not. Because see, it still comes down to you. You can have all the evidence in the world that comes and you can still reject it. Okay, then reject it. So as you... Uh, Remember we said that doubting doesn't send you to hell, but reject all the evidence <laughs> in front of you, and we'll see what happens with that. And if you believe in, in uh, Christianity, in, in, in Jesus Christ, there is a consequence for that. People don't want to hear that, but there is. So the question is, um, well, let me give you some 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 concepts, some concepts that you need to think about. If you believe that God is dead, or you need more proof, let me, let me start you out with this. One thing you will believe is that there are concepts of good and evil. Now, most, most people aren't going to argue with that. Why? Because they've seen it. <laughs> they've seen good and they seem evil those are real those are not illusions and the bible clearly depicts a struggle between good and evil i like this graphic because it it, it, it supports that there is a struggle and and if you believe in uh Christianity, and, and, and I tell you the truth, you believe in, in, in most religions, there's a battle that's going on. What's the battle over? Your soul. Christianity, clearly, there's a battle going on between good and evil, and the prize is your immortal soul, your eternal life. Mm. Now, another concept, first concept, Good and evil are no illusions. Second concept we're going to study is life is no accident. Life is no accident. I say, what do you mean by that? I'll tell you what I mean by that. One concept is called nothing from nothing leaves nothing. Life didn't accidentally happen. All this that we have in the world and the universe today didn't accidentally happen. People try to teach you that. That it's just, all this jumped out of nothing. You know, that's not a reasonable explanation <laughs> for why we're all here. Um, the other con next concept, first concept was good and evil, no illusion. Second one is life is no accident. Third one is life has meaning and purpose. We're here. And most people will believe that they have a purpose that they have a um, meaning. Life has a meaning. Why we just put here to live our few years here and just die and that's it. Now, for one, I don't want to believe in that. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's ridiculous. The question, and people have searched for it all their lives or, or, or throughout history, is that what is the meaning and the purpose of life? And you know what gives you the explanation of that? Religion. <laughs> Religion. So keep that in mind too. See, man, man is we're we're constantly searching for um, the evidence. We're con we're constantly searching for the evidence. Now, and the reason we're searching for evidence is because the concepts I just told you: good and evil, no illusions, life is no accident, life has meaning and purpose is because that's not evidence. That's concepts. Intangible concepts of that. 
And the people say, we need more than you just telling us that. Show me some evidence. Hmm. So the question is, where is the evidence? Now, even though we're constantly searching for it, archaeologists uh, are looking for it. And, and this is kind of representation of that. Why? Because they dig in the ground. They dig and, and they, they want to find things that previous generations of people have left and somehow got buried in the ground. And they dig and dig and dig and they find. And what they find, they make uh, opinions about. I found this little piece of uh, uh, pottery or whatever, and it means this. Now, understand, they may find a piece of pottery that somebody had thousands of years ago. It's when they interpret it as to what it means is you got to be careful. You got to be careful about it. So, but archaeologists, we get a lot of information, evidence from archaeologists. We get a lot of information from scientists, and scientists... What basically they do is search through evidence to find evidence. <laughs> Think about it. They, they, they take what they know is, an, is true, examine it, and try to find other evidence in that. That's what scientists do. They, um, it's just the way that we and our limited ability to understand this world have to deal with it. And then you have those philosophers, those atheists, those agnostics, who actually take the lack of evidence as evidence. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. They say, well, I don't see any evidence, so that means there is no evidence. All right. So how do we prove these things in our everyday life? We and in our lives, we take in certain information and we come to certain conclusions that we trust. We 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 decide on on how we live our lives based on certain information we have. We rely on certain information to see how we interact with other people or go to CSI. What do they do? They collect a little piece of evidence. And they let that evidence show them what is the truth. Mm. Now, so the question is, in our everyday life, what do we do? Let's say um, a crime. Let's, let's take, for example, a crime. We, we get all that evidence. We collect it. We analyze it. And then we once we analyze it, we'll say, this is, this is the truth based on the evidence that we have. And we, in a criminal situation, we take that evidence that we feel proves certain points or certain actions of other people, and what do we do with it? We go to trial, we present that evidence, and we reach a verdict. This is how we do not only in trials, how we do in our everyday life. When you deal with your kids, and you, you didn't actually see them do something, but you look at the evidence... And you say, oh, yeah, you did it. Even though they lied to you in your face and all that kind of thing. You rely on the evidence so that you can reach a conclusion. That's how we live our lives. That's how we prove everything in our daily lives, our professions, whatever. We determine facts and we test the truth or falsity of the facts to reach a determination which profoundly affects people's lives and even to the point as to whether they should live or die based on evidence. Based on evidence. Now, in this study, we're going to try to show you the evidence that's been collected throughout eternity. And some people may tell you there's no evidence. I'm here to tell you there's a wealth of evidence to support the case for God and to support the case for Christ. And so, in our everyday lives, whether we're in court or whether we um, are dealing with our kids or just in our profession or whatever, what is the evidence that we rely upon in order to point us to the reality or the truth? Hmm. Well, one of the first things 
that we do. And I, I put this in my case file. This is a case file. Why? Because I'm an attorney. That's how we do it. Okay? And we affect everybody's lives with, with uh, the cases we present in court for judges to to um, decide on on the most important things in our life. Evidence. What do we deem evidence enough in order for us to make certain decisions in our life? One, the most powerful evidence is eyewitness testimony. You get an eyewitness to come into court and tell you, I was there. I saw this person. He took his gun. He pointed it at that other person and shot that person. And that person is dead. I saw it. Now, <coughs> that's, that's great evidence. You still test that witness to make sure that that witness's testimony is credible. And if it is credible, then we accept it. And if we have our witness testimony that we accept, even if it's not true, <laughs> even if it's not true, we will base our decision on that. We will base our, if we believe it, we based our, our decision on that. So expert, so eyewitness testimony is important. And as we go through this case to justify God and Jesus, the question, are there any eyewitness testimony that we can rely upon? Well, you go to the Bible and you have some, some books that in the first four books of the New Testament, is all eyewitness testimony or testimony of a of a person who's writing down what some eyewitness told them. What are you talking about? Matthew, Paul, Luke, and John. And you can even go first, but if we just stay stay with the gospels. In our everyday life, we rely on eyewitness testimony. Why wouldn't we rely on eyewitness testimony to support the existence of God and Christ? We also rely on documentary evidence. A document that someone may have written or a document, let's say if we want to show that somebody cashed a check that they weren't supposed to cash, we go to get the bank statement and we say, all right, yeah, you did. There it is. This is documented. So we rely on documentary evidence too. We're going to, as we go through this study, we're going to show you documentary evidence to support the case for God and the case for Christ. And then, even though one, one other thing we do, let's say we have a um, eyewitness testimony that we kind of say, well, I don't know if that's as credible as it could be. We'll, we'll show you some documentary evidence that maybe helps support that or maybe shows that it's not. But corroborating evidence, evidence that corroborates someone's eyewitness testimony, we will take that as evidence also. And then, of course, scientific evidence we like to, we like to bleed to a certain extent in scientists. So any scientific evidence, psychological evidence. We uh, we in, in today's world, and we, we're far beyond Freud and all that kind of thing, where we now know that there are some psychological things. You know, and the thing about psychological evidence is a lot of times people don't, don't understand why that evidence exists. They do understand it exists. Someone's state of mind. Or whatever. Are they just crazy? Well, there are certain guidelines where we know when somebody's crazy, you know, where they uh where they're seeing things and that are aren't there and talking to themselves and doing crazy stuff outside the bell curve and all that kind of thing. And uh that's evidence. We even have profile evidence. When someone someone says uh the the FBI is good at this, profiling and all that, where they've actually um, identified serial killers based on what they call the profile of that person. They can look at certain evidence and say, you know what, this person is a person who works at this, at, at this place over here, and this is a person that uh, probably has uh, 10 children or has a mother that they hate and all that kind of stuff. Profiling. So, they go look for that, and sometimes that's exactly what they find. So we rely on profile evidence. Of course, we rely on fingerprint evidence too. You see the fingerprint evidence, and, and 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 now DNA, and all that kind of thing can be very, very powerful evidence. Mm -hmm. 
So we're going to show you a form of fingerprint evidence that's going to uh, uh, support the case for God and the case for Christ. And then medical evidence. You know, there are certain things about the human body that can't be denied. That can't be denied. It works a certain way. And there are certain things that, that, that happen. And how are we going to show you this? Well, the medical evidence here, because a lot of people say some religions, um, counter-religions to Christianity, all that, will tell you that Christ didn't die on that cross. And you say, uh, well, the eyewitness testimony says, boom, 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 happened. Oh, yeah, he was dead. He was dead. I oh, know he didn't. So we're going to show you from uh, medical evidence, which we rely on today, to prove Christ didn't die on that cross. And then there's circumstantial evidence. What is that? That is evidence that is collected, that there's no direct evidence, but all this other evidence only leads to one conclusion. And that's the truth of the matter. And we, you say, well, that's not a good way. Well, you know what? We we uh, find people guilty of murder and crimes all the time based on circumstantial evidence in our lives. So the very uh, way that we prove things in today's world, we're going to show you and, and give you evidence for the case for Christ and the case for for, for uh, God. Now, you just went through this Floyd case, the George Floyd case. Now, that's a case where you rarely have certain evidence. They had video evidence whereby we know the girl who took that video, if we didn't have that, we'd have come to a different conclusion. So the best evidence, of course, is where you can go back in time and look at what happened. And that's, that's what happened there. But we don't always have that. But we don't let that stop us from trying people and, and uh, finding, convicting people and all that. Now, we have, we, we send people to the electric chair. We send people, we take all their assets and all that kind of, and all kind of things based on this type of evidence. We're going to show you. Uh, the evidence. And uh, another thing I want you to keep in mind, my experience as a lawyer has led me to an ins inescapable conclusion about discovering the truth about a case. And what is that? Keep an open mind. <laughs> keep an open mind until you get all the evidence. The biggest mistake people make in um, evaluating evidence is they already have a conclusion before they see the evidence. And so regardless of what the evidence is collected after they reach their conclusion, they're going to come to the same conclusion. Regardless. What you have to do is let the evidence lead you to the truth. Don't lead the evidence yourself. Once you believe, and, and, and understand this, sometimes you get to a point where, okay, that's all the proof I have. I've eliminated with the proof I have I've, I've been able to eliminate everything that could not have happened. So what's left is what did happen. Think about that. You do it with your kids. Your kids will tell you, no, no, this happened and that. And you prove that. Okay, that's not true. They'll say, well, well this, this. And you say, well, that's not true. And you, you, you break them all the way down to a certain point and they, they don't have anything. Well, I ain't got nothing else, the kids said. And you say, that's fine, because I know now all this didn't happen. I know only one thing could happen. Why? That's what's left. And you did do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, you tell me you haven't done that with your kids, because your kids are trying. Understand. Now, and then we'll look at living proof after uh, as we go through this study. You say, what is living proof? What are you talking about? You know, un Contrary to what you may hear and what people may tell you on, on, on the news and all that, Christianity is actually on the march. What? I thought Christianity, well, you know, it may be dying in your church. <laughs> you go around the world and you'll see that Christianity is 
surviving in places like China, in places like India, and all that. Even though the government's trying to stamp it out and all that kind of thing, even even in in uh, Muslim countries and all that, there are there are people wanting to believe in Christ, the living proof. We'll we'll get into that also, and then we'll come to the verdict. At the end of the study, we're going to come to the verdict. We we'll say, uh, all you as jurors will say, members of the jury, have you come to a, a verdict? And what is that verdict? After all the evidence is in, remember I said, wait till all the evidence is in before you come to a conclusion. And then, and then, remember I said that the this world is this information age and all that? They're not going to just go based upon you tell them they need to believe. You give them some evidence, and they will. You give them some evidence, and they will. Not all. But one thing you have to understand is that the truth will set you free. It says that. Now, there are two things we're going to use as we go through this study. And one of them is a movie, I don't know if you've seen, it's called Risen. And uh, <coughs> is. uh for the concept that the truth will set you free. And Marvel's going to key that up. Um, and what happens when unbelievers are confronted with the truth? And this is just a clip. I serve the Roman Empire. I fought wars against those who did not believe in our gods. But nothing could prepare me for the truth that has now risen. He was very special. They're fanatics. What was his name? He was called Yeshua. The man's dead. His followers are in hiding. He's been a threat. Take control out there and finish things. The tomb is sealed, guarded with your life. If this body vanishes, we have a potential messiah. Where has he gone? You tell me. You will track down the corpse of Yeshua. Oh, no! What happened to the Nazarene? He's right here. Open your heart and see. movie and you can pull that up on uh, the movie channel or YouTube or whatever. We're going to take certain clips out of that in in our presentation. So you can uh, I'm sorry I should have changed this slide but it's uh, it shows this unbeliever and they use the, uh, the Roman centurion who was there and uh, made sure Jesus was dead and then he sees him alive again. Ain't nothing like proof, people. <laughs> and what happens to an unbeliever who's confronted with sufficient truth? Become believers. And that's what happened in the Roman Empire. And, you know, people say, well, that was way back then. All that. Understand, the Roman Empire was the most powerful empire in the world at the time. And they believed in other gods and all that. And, and they ended up believing in Jesus Christ. Believing in God. But see, they were closer to the event. You know, I bet a lot of you, if Jesus walked up here and, and uh, appeared before you and showed you become a believer too. You become a believer too. But you know one thing that uh, Christ said in, that, in Holy Week as he was uh, talking to his disciples? He says that uh, you believe because you have seen. He said, blessed are those who believe who have not seen which is all of us at this time. So what's all of us the conclusion? Like I said, this is my favorite study. Why? Because God's not dead. And uh, the other uh, movie, we're going to take some clips off. Marvel's going to show you a little clip on. And uh, we will use this throughout. 
almost as a pain. And if they let them understand that uh, something like this vaccination is a miracle <laughs> that normally would not have happened and that even though we know that the, uh, that the pandemic, it comes from you also. That, that you have given us, as you always do, a way out. So we want to thank you, Father. Bless all those who tuned in. Bless all those who are going to review this at a later time, Father. And bless all of us for one more week at least, Father, with a head of protection. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Gap, standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Standing in the gap Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap one love for all, so we all can make it in. Studying to show ourselves approved. Rightly to find the word of truth. Increasing our faith to envision our freedom. So we all can glorify our God. Standing in the gap. Standing for Jesus Standing in the gap for family and friends Standing in the gap One love for all So we all can make it in Make it in Make it in Make it in Want to hear him say good Good and faithful servant Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, enter to the joy of the Lord. Want to hear him say, good, good and faithful servant. Want to hear him say, the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say good Good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say Hear him to the joy of the Lord Wanna hear him say good And good and faithful servant Wanna hear him say Hear him to the joy of the Lord Of the Lord Joy of the Lord Lord Joy of the Lord, of the Lord.